it appears everyone is seated, so welcome everyone tonight at our next event of Budapest Lectures. May I direct your attention to this, uh, this place. You will be allowed to ask questions through an online portal which I have access to. So this is how we're going to do the Q&A. And whoever requires, there's going to be interpretation as well. Uh, our guest tonight is Christian Alting von Goizau, and he's nothing less than a veritable citizen of the world. Born in the US, then raised in the Netherlands, and now he's currently living and teaching in Austria. And besides that, he is also a real friend of Hungary, as he's been given the uh, Officer's Cross of the Order of the Merit recently in 2019. So it's a huge honor for us uh, that he's here with us uh, tonight. My name is Martin Schuyok. I will be asking the tough questions and moderating tonight's talk. Our guest, he's a lawyer by profession, having graduated in the Netherlands and also in Germany with specializations in civil and European law, which he also then practiced internationally for a short while in the private sector. Besides that, he's a student of philosophy and theology in the United States and in France, and also he's obtained a PhD in philosophy of law in Austria, and the title uh, for his dissertation was Human Dignity and Law in Post-War Europe. This was published internationally in 2013. And I'm sure we're going to address this book a little when we go into the questions as well. Uh, besides these academic functions and achievements, he's also the president and rector of the ITI Catholic University near Vienna, uh, which was founded by Pope uh, St. Saint John Paul II. And besides being a university professor, he's also a very passionate and devout educator. What, uh, what is a clear sign of this is that he's the founder and chairman of the board of Schola Thomas Morris, which is a high school near Vienna that specialized in classical education. And then, from all of the positions that he's held over the years, the one that brings us closest to tonight's topic, which is politics and lawmaking, is his position of president of the International Catholic Legislators Network, which he himself has created in 2010. So, Professor Goizau, thank you very much for being here with us and being open to all our, all our questions that might come up with regards to politics and lawmaking. What should the foundational principles be today? Thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. You it's always me? good to be in Budapest. Yeah. Thank you, again. Uh, cutting to the chase, and it might be a little bit in medias res. Uh, if we talk about politics and lawmaking and everything that comes at this intersection, uh, there is, I would say, academic consensus, at least in Hungary, about many of the foundational principles of lawmaking in general. And to start off, lawmaking shall serve, as they say, the public or common good. Mm -hmm. uh, to add to this, there's a very recent but also very controversial controversial theory of constitutional interpretation <clears throat> that originates in the United States and has been brought about by US COVID response. It's called common good constitutionalism. Mm. And it posits uh, that there is a, a legitimate approach uh, arguing that a strong state direction of uh, the life of its subjects uh, is absolutely in order in order to achieve the common good. Uh, to bring some Hungarian examples, the expression common good or public good also appears in the fundamental law when it talks about interpretation of law by the court. And then there's uh, our law on social participation in legislation, which also has a reference to common good, saying that it is attained by uh, making laws better or improving them through engaging more groups from society and engaging input from many sources. Then uh, we have our 2011 law on the freedom of conscience and religion, which also governs the establishment of churches. And in its, in its preamble, it says, and I quote, the respect of human dignity shall be recognized as the key to foster the common good. So there are some indicators of what the common good might mean in the Hungarian terms. But looking at the question broadly or globally, uh, maybe with a focus on human dignity, because this is one of your areas of expertise, what would you say uh, public good is, or common good is, and mm -hmm. how can it be defined? That would be my first question. Right, well, I think it's good if we look at the question of the common good is that we start at the metaphysical level, because first of all, the common good is not something that 
we invent or we define, and I will come to speak later about uh, the relation of that to, to human dignity. I always like, it when we speak about the common good, to quote or to get inspiration from the greatest legal thinker and theologian of all times, or one of them is, of course, St. Thomas Aquinas. Because in his Summa Theologica, in questions 90 and further, he actually addresses the relationship between law and the common good. And he has a definition of the common good that, of course, I'm not saying it literally, uh, that runs something like this. The end of every human being is to find happiness. However, not happiness in the way that we often tend to think in our wellness society. Um, what St. Thomas means to say is the individual happiness is to be able to do what is good, to be able to do what is just, but always in the sense of the community. That is to say, my happiness alone is not enough to define the common good. And happiness, please understand happiness need not as the very limited your happiness, but you can also see the word happiness as what is good, and that's, that's therefore also the word common good, or what is just. But always looking at it in the way of what is good, not only for me, but what is good for all the members of the community. And this is extremely important because this is often forgotten in the individualistic approach that our societies have. And also, uh, I see that problem, for example, in, in the example you just noted, also in the way many of the COVID uh, policies have been implemented. Uh, and that we see that, for example, in the United States very strongly, because when we really speak about the common good, we actually first need to have a debate in society, an open debate, how the common good, that what is good for each individual within the community, is actually being taken into consideration. And of course, that is something which has been sorely missing in many of those policies uh, that, that you referred to. So the common good starts with the idea there is a community, I am part of that community, and we need to find the happiness of each of the members without leaving out one of them. And this is the balance that has to be struck. Thank you very much. And absolutely, lawmaking is about balance as well as politics are. Uh, now that we have, we have addressed the core of lawmaking and the purpose it shall serve, uh, which is the common good, uh, I would uh, continue with, the, with an enumeration uh, because there are some consensually core principles of lawmaking that are other than the common good. For instance, uh, observing the rule of law through, through clarity of norms, creating legal certainty. Uh, and there's obviously, especially now, there's a lot of debate about these principles, uh, but this is a rather more or less con con consensual list. And uh, my question to you now is that, do you think that recent debates regarding the clarity, the exact meaning of these principles, like the rule of law, for example, induce necessary changes in thinking about the foundations and the fundamental principles of lawmaking? I don't think we need changes in the sense of changing any of the principles. I think what is really necessary is a rediscovery of what those foundational principles are. Because I would not say, maybe, um, maybe Hungary is a little bit a paradise in that regard, but at least the way I observe most liberal democracies, there is not much common understanding of what those foundational principles of law actually are. In fact, we are dealing with a very challenging problem, and that is, of course, the ideology of legal positivism, which basically um, excludes any transcendent level that excludes anything but that which has been decided either by the court of law or by the democratically uh, elected majority in parliament, if they decide that that is the law and therefore that is good or uh, that is not good, therefore that has been defined. But that is a real problem. 
because we know from history, we know where the dangers lies, uh, lie of legal positivism. So it's not about redefining, it's about rediscovering what those foundational principles are. And I, I really want to warn, because I think amongst many people in law, because this, this ideology of legal positivism is so strongly present in our law schools. Uh, for example, in my law school, I went to the very prestigious law school at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. Um, you know, the whole, for example, the whole concept of the natural law was never even mentioned. Uh, it was a very legal positivistic approach that is the reigning approach at most law schools in the world. But just historically, it is important to remember what happened in history when that went to the extreme. Nazi Germany is the best example of that. The democracy was turned off or shut down by a majority vote of the German parliament in 1933 and then later, uh, with the enabling law. And then later the Nuremberg race laws were also passed by a majority of that parliament at that time. And we all know the rest of the history of the Holocaust. So we have to be extremely careful uh, with that idea that basically the human being is, per definition, the highest authority in lawmaking. Because when we reject that there is a higher order, and you don't need to be a religious person for that, I'll come to speak about that later. When you reject that, then you start playing God yourself. And so, going back to your question, I don't think there is a lot of common understanding on what are the foundational principles of lawmaking. And I think we have to rediscover what those foundational principles are. And that should actually be the work of law schools to actually train students in thinking. And for example, if I may ask the audience a question, who of you has read Cicero on the foundations of law? Well, one person. Now, I don't know if you're, many of you might not be law students, but I think this is very telling. This is very telling. And by the way, Cicero is not, uh, is not, was not a, a religious man. He, he was a Roman consul and a Roman jurist. But he has written in the laws, uh, one of his uh, most important works, he has written about what are the foundational principles of law. And the fact that only one person in the audience has actually read that, I think, points out to the problem. Absolutely, absolutely. And so you mentioned one of the paths turning toward natural law and bringing it into the conversation and discourse. Are there any other paths you think would be uh, commendable to follow? What do you mean other paths, other? Uh, of, re of rediscovering. Right. Well, I think, I think it really starts with studying the sources again. Uh, we have to study the sources again, and we have to move away from the idea that lawmaking is exclusively dependent on the political will. Because also by political will, by a majority law, unjust laws can be passed. And we see many of them also these days. So we have to rediscover again the sources of law, and that would be the most important path. And another path, some humility of us human beings when it comes to the question of lawmaking, and probably going a step down and accepting that, um, as Plato already said, it is not man but a god that must be the measure of all things. Now, Plato was, of course, a Greek who believed in all sorts of different gods. Um, so he, he was not a, a Christian, for example. But he already understood that basic concept. And this is why um, there's a, a fantastic quote that I always like to give. When Pope Benedict XVI visited the German parliament, in September 2011, he gave a famous lecture there. It's called 
the foundations of law, the listening heart on the foundations of law. Please Google it and, and read it. It's, it's one of the most important texts that has ever been written about the foundations of law. And in it, he said something fundamental, and maybe I, I, will ask, I will answer your question better in that way. He says, Benedict XVI, he says, other than all other religious traditions, the Catholic Church has never either imposed or even suggested to society, to secular society, a revealed law in the sense of saying, you know, this is the law that comes from God, revealed law, you know, this is our, our book, and this has to be, so to say, implemented one-on-one -on, -one on society. No, he says, the Catholic Church has never done that. It has pointed to nature and reason as the sources of law. What does he mean? Nature being the reality of the created order. What it means to be human, how we are created as human beings, how we function as human beings in community and human society. And we can all understand it through the use of reason. But it's through nature and reason are the true sources of law. That's something, and that's, in fact, exactly what Aristotle says, and what St. Thomas Aquinas says, and what Cicero says. They all say the same in a little bit different words. Absolutely, thank you very much. Uh, now, you've mentioned unjust laws, you've mentioned and we've established that there are no stone tablets that we are given the law at, basically, but we talked about the common good as well. And uh, I'm, I have a clear picture in my head when I was in law school and I attended law school when we studied lawmaking, the uh, most basic concept or definition that we needed to uh, learn was that of a legal norm. And it says, that is a generally binding rule of conduct. And in, in light of this definition, since we're talking about the intersection of law and politics, what sort of influence could or should politics have on lawmaking in these terms that defines these binding rules of conduct? Uh, and I'm asking right now in terms of value choices. Are there red lines? And if yes, are they thin or thick? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, if, if I may, uh, may be so bold, I prefer not to speak about values because I think values in our current secular society has become uh, a very empty word because everybody speaks about values. It has become something of a product of choice. You know, I choose to have these values and they can change. So I prefer, understanding what your question is, I prefer to speak about principles because principles are grounded in, in, in human nature, in, in, in tradition. So I like to speak about principles. Now, as to your question, I want to start with reading a quote from Cicero to, to, um, to give a little bit an indication into what direction I would, I would be going in answering your question. Because, of course, we speak about justice here. Right? That's the, the core principle with the legal norm. Justice has to be served. So before defining what the red lines will be, the thick or the thin red lines, I like the, the way you asked that question, we of course first have to always take a few steps back and what is the basic idea, the basic principle with, of lawmaking, of legal norms? Well, that is that justice is served. That is why it's so important to remember that the great thinkers already of the Middle Ages already said, and, and, and even of the Greek, uh, philosopher said that an unjust law is not a law. So the, a law loses its character of law and loses its character of being a binding legal norm the moment that law is unjust. So let's go back to that, that idea of, of, of justice. Cicero says the following, but if the principles of justice were founded on the decrees of peoples, the edicts of princes, or the decisions of judges, the justice would sanction robbery and adultery and forgery of wills. He writes this in the first, Christ in the first century BC. And he says later, he says, but if so great a power belongs to the decisions and decrees of fools that the laws of nature can be changed by their votes, 
then why do they not ordain that what is bad and baneful shall be considered good and salutary? Or if a law can make justice out of injustice, can it not also make good out of bad? These are strong words, you know, the first century before Christ. And, and he was, as you know, Cicero was a Roman consul, uh, was also himself uh, persecuted. He didn't have a particularly, um, a particularly nice ending, uh, Cicero. Uh, parts uh, of his body were actually exposed in the Senate by his enemies who actually didn't like exactly these words. Uh, they actually persecuted him for these words because they were those that thought that, you know, if we have the power, we can decide anything. So, to, to, to immediately start going to one such principle, one such red line, for me, that is the fundamental starting point of where justice in law should all be about. And that is only partly covered by constitutions and by human rights treaties. And that starts because that's where the red line then also starts. That starts, obviously, you have mentioned it before, with the respect for human dignity. But the respect for human dignity, and I will come to speak later about what is really human dignity, obviously is unthinkable if there is not a foundational principle in society that is non-negotiable, and that is the respect for human life. That's really where it all starts. Because all our rights and all our constitutions and all our lawmaking, what's the point of it if the lives that you know, are affected by that are not the primary matter that needs to be protected. So the protection of life, and I say here very deliberately from the moment of conception, because there is no other point biologically that a life starts, but the protection of life from the first moment that life starts is for me such a thick red line, is such for me such a foundational principle because all else comes from that. All other rights come from that. And a society that hasn't gotten that will continue to run into many problems, as we see all around us. Okay, that's a very big, thick red line, I understand. Yeah. Are there any thinner ones that you could identify for us? Any thinner ones? Well, um, of course, we, uh, we have the question of freedom of expression. Right? The, the freedom of thought, because there is, what is the principle of the freedom of expression, for example, talking about, uh, talking about a thinner red line. I would say we have to make a distinction between rights that are so foundational and so fundamental, fundamental that we can hardly in any way um, make exceptions on them. Of course, some of you might immediately think, well, what about if I go into self-defense because I'm being attacked by somebody and I kill that person? Or what about the theory of just war? That's a whole other discussion. But the difference between that and what I just said is that when we speak about the beginning of life, that is an innocent life and a defenseless life. Whilst when we speak about self-defense when you're being attacked or the whole question of just war, of course, there are already lives that might not be innocent and are in a whole different setting. So I just <laughs> want to say that. But there are many other fundamental rights that immediately come in contact with two aspects, responsibility and community. Because this is something very often forgotten. Every right we claim we have always comes with a responsibility. And that is also the case, for example, with the uh, the right to freedom of expression. There we go back to what I said earlier about the common good. There's always the consideration to be made when I claim my right, here we say the freedom of expression, how is my execution of that right, my use of that right, 
affecting the community as a whole, staying with the definition of St. Thomas, staying the community, the happiness of each individual member. There comes in the responsibility. So there are a whole series of rights where we simply have to accept that there, there is a point where, because we live in the community, there might be, in certain situations, limits. The important thing, however, is that, again, that is clearly defined according to firm principles and not arbitrariness. Because that's often what happens when governments become too powerful. The way the population can actually go about executing these rights often becomes arbitrary. But I would say a thinner red line is limitations to the freedom of expression. Because there are specific situations where that may be within a very clear framework that may be justifiable because of the responsibility somebody has to take. But it can never lead to the fact for that right actually being completely pushed away. It all has to do with my responsibility towards the other citizen. A lot of recent discourse is about some modern challenges regarding freedom of expression, for example, in, term of, in terms of online platforms, and we might return to this toward the end, uh, but I want to put a pin in this for now, and I'm going to ride this horse, if you allow me this analogy, uh, that you just uh, began. Because besides community and responsibility, there are, there's the rights of others as another standpoint, for mm -hmm. example. And uh, just, you just because you mentioned freedom of expression, in the Seventh Amendment of the uh, Fundamental Law of Hungary, there's been a uh, constitutional limitation of the freedom of expression with regard to privacy concerns, the sanctity of the home, the uh, calm and solitude of the family. Again, smaller communities, but still important. Uh, and this was subject to extensive debate uh, internationally as well, whether we should uh, be able to do this, a, a constitution should be able to do this. My question now would be whether you are aware in your respective uh, areas of uh, expertise, uh, the US, Netherlands, or, or Germany, Austria, whether you are aware of any similar trends in constitutional regulation or uh, any sort of academic or, or uh, jurisprudential thinking about introducing these kinds of limitations? Well, I think we, we see a lot of such limitations. Now, the limitation you speak about, and we spoke about it before, is a, is a reasonable limitation. And, uh, and that is exactly what, what, my, what my example uh, said about you know, the responsibility and the community. But I think we are also seeing in Europe and the United States what I find a very worrying development where, for ideolog ideological reasons, freedom of expression is actually being limited. And where it has nothing to do anymore with this focus I have on responsibility and community, but where it's all about feelings of people. And uh, I actually, therefore, make a clear distinction. When we speak about the freedom of expression, it is not about limiting the freedom of expression itself, the right itself, but the way in which I go about expressing it. The example, and then I'll come to, to examples in other countries, but the example you, you gave about the Seventh Amendment in, in, in Hungary, it's not that those people who cannot stand in front of the houses of those public officials screaming and making noise, that they cannot use their freedom of expression, but the privacy of that specific family needs to be protected, so they will have to express their views elsewhere. But it's not that they cannot express their views. Eh? But there is a certain responsibility towards, as you say, the rights of others, yeah, that requires not that they cannot express, but that not at that place. And that's, that's, that's a fine-tuning. Now, what we, however, see, and what really worries me, is that there is a lot of um, speech limitation and speech policing going on, especially in social media uh, and online platforms, where many things cannot be said anymore that are simply facts. And that is because 
we are moving in our, most of our liberal democracies in a direction what I call the move from the rule of law to the rule of feelings, where it's no longer the rule of law means, as we spoke earlier about, we have certain set principles. And within those set principles, we live together in a democratic society. And we all accept that there are certain set principles. And those set principles are exactly what Benedict called nature accessible through reason. That there, are, there are certain things we accept because they are a reality in front of us. That is becoming increasingly difficult. I don't know if you have followed the, um, the language acrobatics that have been taking place recently in English-speaking media for a new uh, way of trying to describe the fact that we are a man or we are a woman, but it's no longer politically correct to say you're a man or a woman. So they have been doing all sort of linguistic acrobatics. And I don't want to repeat here the, the, the descriptions that were then come up with because it's just too, too ridiculous. But that shows that we are in a, in, a, in a situation where we are rejecting foundational principles and where we see speech policing actually gravely limiting our freedom of expression. There are countries now where you cannot say without getting in trouble to say that a father is always a man and a mother is always a woman. There are situations where in certain countries you can get into legal trouble for that. That is an exact situation where we see developments, we see that very strongly currently in the United States, that really worry me in answer to your question. Where we see limitations to the freedom of expression that go far beyond the concept of responsibility and community that I spoke about. Why? Because they are no longer about established principles, they are only about the feelings of people. Now, we, we, we respect people's feelings and we want to you know, have, let them have their feelings, but that doesn't mean that the whole of society should develop a new language just because we all have feelings. Because if we start doing that, then in the shortest possible times, we cannot say anything anymore. Because I can have this feeling, you can have that feeling, you can have that feeling, and we will just go crazy because you cannot say anything anymore. Uh, you've been talking about limitations of rights, so this gave me an idea, uh, in also in terms of the common good as well. Uh, the fundamental law has a provision uh, on fundamental rights regulation, and it says, and I have to return to values to some extent here, mm -hmm. I quote, a fundamental right may be restricted to protect the constitutional value to the extent absolutely necessary proportionate to the objective pursued and with full respect of the essential content of that fundamental right. And without being overly legal here, respecting our, uh, the sensitivity of our audiences as well, obviously, I just want to ask, what do you think the margin of appreciation or the legroom, the room for maneuver for the legislature is to define such constitutional values? And also a follow-up, even Oh, and I'm curious about what you think, whether this is at all a legislative task or responsibility. I doubt whether it is. Um, and of course, this is, and I hope I'm answering your question the right way with that, but this is always the problem with constitutions, because in constitutions we say, this is the constitution, this is the basis on which we build you know, the rule of law in our country, and basically a constitution is... is is meant to, to be unchangeable because they are, those foundational principles are to be found in the Constitution. But the problem, of course, is that the moment the legislature starts tweaking on that Constitution, it very quickly becomes political expediency or arbitrariness, whoever at that time has the majority. So, I don't know if I'm answering your question in the way, but this is very tricky terrain. And I, you know, but the question then is, well, where should then that right be, you know, to define that or to, to, to make that clear? 
One possible answer, if I may say so, mm -hmm. is, for example, with the Constitutional Court. And I'm only mentioning this right. because you've uh, talked about fetal life uh, right. previously. And, for example, fetal life is considered a constitutional value right. because the Constitution doesn't go for, as far as to say that the fetus has a right to life mm -hmm. and therefore in introduces a constitutional ban on abortion. And it's, it's not the case, especially in regard of the entirety of the legal system, but it was definitely re uh, acknowledged or recognized as a constitutional value. Mm -hmm. And freedom of speech in some cases, especially uh, with regard to privacy limitations, has also been acknowledged or recognized as a, as a constitutional value. So this is what brought on my, uh, mm -hmm. my question. But I think, that, I think, yes, of course, a constitutional court would be the logical place where those things are defined. But the problem we see is that constitutional courts like politics in general and parliaments are so to say downstream from culture, which means whatever is already happening in culture and has already been happening in culture, then a few later, a few years later is in a way confirmed in the court of law by its decisions or in parliaments by their lawmaking. And so we have a little bit of a problem there because then basically, and we see that increasingly, uh, we see that increasingly how constitutional, you see that specifically with the United States Supreme Court, you see how it is basically following whatever is in culture and is trying to interpret or reinterpret the constitution in a way that fits in the current cultural narrative instead of what some members on the Supreme Court would say actually looking now, but what did the framers of the Constitution actually want to say here and meant to say here? And, and the example you, you, you give of the pre-born life is, is an example of that. Because in my view, and people will hold me extreme for that, but in my view, we will never be able to solve any of those issues if the pre-born life is not respected and protected from the moment of conception for the simple reason that that is the basis of all rights, because it's life. So we are, I, I see with your answer, we are returning to those red lines. Yes. Also the deculturalization of courts and, and, and again, life uh, in general. And with this, I'm going to cut back to the pin that I put in human dignity, because we talked about rules of conduct, value choices, red lines. Uh, and obviously human dignity, especially in the era of post-war reconstruction, has always been a red line when it comes to constitutional regulation, law and politics. And uh, in your book, which I have not read, uh, but I'm very curious about, uh, at least according to the summary, you talk about uh, a principled understanding of human dignity as a legal concept, which is, as you say, much used but little understood. And why do you think, and you argue, that human dignity is little understood? And if so, then why have a reliance on it uh, in fundamental and human rights discourse that define many choices of values in, in terms of lawmaking? This would be my question. Well, I think it's, it's good in answering that question to make a very brief um, flashback to history because the whole idea of human dignity as a legal concept and as a foundation for human rights law actually was born on the ash heaps and, and suffering of the Second World War, and especially, of course, the Holocaust, and, of course, also the horrors of the communist regime of the Soviet Union and of China, the Gulag Archipelago and everything that happened there. So the whole idea of human dignity came from a revolt of conscience, looking at the extermination camps, looking at the concentration camps, uh, looking at the piles of bodies, the gas chambers, you name it, and the, the horror of Stalin and Mao, and etc. That led to a revolt of conscience that actually allowed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to come into existence and actually have human dignity as a, as a foundational legal concept. However, it was never defined what human dignity actually is. And because it was, it was not defined because the framers of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and thereafter, of course, at the same time, European Convention on Human Rights, um, they, they could never agree. They could agree that there are a certain number of rights that need to be protected, 
But since they came from all over the world in different cultures, where it uh, concerns the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there was never a consensus what the basis, you know, the philosophical basis are for these rights. So it was agreed, Jacques Maritain, who was one of the people who was involved, that describes it very well in one of his books, um, it was agreed that they would leave the question of the philosophical foundations and would just focus on the right themselves. So this has led us into a situation that human <laughs> dignity has become a sort of catch-all phrase that is being used a lot, is being used by many, but nobody really knows the definition of it, and therefore it can be used and misused by many. And the reason why that is a problem is because we need to, first of all, look at the anthropological meaning of human dignity. Where does the whole idea of human dignity come from? Why is it that our consciences revolted when we saw the concentration camps, the extermination camps, and, and all the horrors of the Second World War and the reign of communism? Why did our conscience revolt? Eh? Because we saw that individual human beings, their human dignity was, uh, was, was attacked. So we have to go, why is that? Because there is an anthropological basis where human dignity come from, comes from, and that is forgotten. And that anthropological basis, we again come back to something that we can see through nature and reason. That is, human dignity as an anthropological understanding is nothing else than the reality of what it means to be human. That is to say, we have been created, we have been created, we, we are not self-created, we have been created. We have been created as man and woman, we have been created with reason, we have been created with certain needs, we need to drink water, we need to sleep, we need to eat food. All these are given, not something we have planned ourselves. It's all been a given. So human dignity, the correct understanding of, the anthropological understanding of human dignity is the realization that I have been created, that I am not self-creating, that as a human being I have certain, um, I have certain needs, obviously, the, the examples of which I just gave you, but that I also have certain features that are just part of me whether I want it or not. Biological features, but also the use of region, uh, reason, we have a certain intelligence. And human dignity, correctly understood, is nothing else than respecting that reality of what it means to be human. And that is a reality that is completely independent of feelings and of opinions. It's just a reality. As I sit here, I am a man and I have been created. I didn't create myself. I didn't choose myself what gender I have because the bi biological reality is that I have been created as such. That's just a biological fact. Yeah? And also the fact that I need to drink water, that I need to sleep, that I need to live in community are all things that I didn't choose myself. That is how I was created as a human being. So respecting human dignity means respecting that reality. And from there then comes all the rest, because if we respect that, also a fact of human nature, it's undeniable, is that our life starts at, uh, at conception. That's just a biological reality. Yeah? There is no other point where life starts. There is only one point, and that's there. That's also something that's just a given. And that, well understood, is human dignity. And if our societies would finally, that's my dream, come to respecting and understanding this meaning of what it means, or this meaning of being human, then the respect and the, 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 the other rights that come from that would follow in a much more logical sense. Thank you uh, for, for clarifying this, this concept and your understanding. Uh, I'm going to follow up this with 
some other things that are much used but little understood. Mm -hmm. And we've already spoken a little bit about online platforms and freedom of speech. Uh, obviously, that's the most important uh, challenge that lawmakers today have to tackle. But can you think of any other areas of lawmaking where some sort of foundational principles need to be refined, redefined, rediscovered, and what these challenges uh, might mean for lawmakers going forward in your respective uh, areas of, of expertise? So the first, uh, the first thing I, I want to come back to, because I already gave that, that, uh, that phrase before, I see a real threat to our democratic societies by this development of the rule of law towards the rule of feelings. And I think I need to explain that a little bit as a, as a real challenge lawmakers also have to deal with. We have to make a distinction between feelings and between reality. Now, people might say, yeah, but feelings are also reality. Yes, they are, but that doesn't mean that I need to forcefully try to adapt reality according to my feelings. I'll give you an example. I can say here and sit now, I am the king of Hungary. And that's how I feel today. And I want you to all respect that and bow for me and uh, you know, give me the, you know, the right honor. Yeah? Now, that sounds maybe a little bit ridiculous, but let's just do this as a thought experiment. Yeah? If that becomes the basis of our lawmaking, my feeling of being the king of Hungary needing to be respected, huh? that is no basis. And then I can go around and, you know, and, and say, yeah, but you have to accept that I'm the king of Hungary and otherwise I'm, you know, I'm going to the parliament and I'm going to get the crown there and I'm going to put it on my hat and you know, this and that. Then I am trying to forcefully adapt reality to my feelings, uh, to my ideas. Now, you might think this sounds ridiculous, but this is what is happening currently in our society. Feelings are fine. They are part of our lives. We all need to deal with it. We feel one day bad, we feel another day good, we feel happy or not. Um, and the same in this whole discussion that you are also confronted with, the whole ideology of transgenderism. If people do not feel well in their body, that needs to be dealt with with patience and care and love and compassion. No question about it. But that doesn't mean that forcefully and violently their feelings that need all the compassion, compassion there is need to actually lead to forcefully adapting the reality that is a given. And we see that in, in, in other areas too. And this is a very dangerous development in our democratic societies. Because if we cannot accept anymore that there are these certain foundational principles and that whatever feeling we have, however justified or understandable that is, cannot be defining our laws and our systems of governments, uh, governance and the way we deal with each other, then we really have a problem. So that's, I really see that as a, as a lawyer, as a legal philosopher, I see that as a real serious problem because we cannot have a functioning rule of law. We cannot have a functioning state if we do not make that distinction between what are certain realities of being human that are there and what are our feelings that we as individual human beings simply have to learn to deal with in cooperation with us? That's one thing that is a real serious problem. The other um, real challenge that I see, um, because you already mentioned that a little bit before, is that um, with the whole uh, online platforms and the whole issue of big tech, it's, it's a completely different area. But what we see is happening is that big tech, although they are private companies, 
are increasingly behaving themselves as public institutions. They do massive censorship. They uh, do massive um, politicization. Yeah? They are very much involved in politics, in the way what content they allow or they, they do not allow. And there is very little transparent, uh, transparency as to what is exactly going on. This is another threat to our democratic societies because there is no transparency and private companies that, are, that have enormous power and that are behaving as public institutions, telling people what they are allowed to think and what they are allowed to say and what they are not allowed to say is a very dangerous development. And this coupled with a second problem there is that those media platforms, these social media, are collecting enormous amount of data together with the government. Big data, we call that. I think there is a very big challenge for legislators around the world to start to find an international mechanism through which there can be a real scrutiny, a system of, of scrutinizing how governments and such big tech companies deal with big data. Um, this is a serious problem that we have. We certainly do not want to move in the direction of China, of the surveillance society. Uh, this is a, a serious problem that we certainly do not want that, that you uh, are credited by social credits on how you behave at the traffic lights and you know, everything is, is done there. So we certainly don't want that. And this brings me to, to another challenge, and that's my third and last challenge I want to mention here, is of course that we are also moving in a direction of both scientific and technological absolutism. And this again has to do with what I mentioned earlier. Since our society is very much, our, our, our legal systems also are very much on this legal positivistic track and there is no higher order, not even the higher order of the created order of nature about which Benedict XVI speaks is respected, the human being starts playing more and more God. And scientific and technological absolutism is in a way trying to be that God and being that new truth that cannot be in any way uh, doubted. And this is a very dangerous development because it goes straight against human dignity. Because it doesn't allow the freedom for the human being who has his dignity and her worth to actually make on the basis of an open debate, a scientific debate, a discernment what is good for him or her. And of course we see that very much in, which, in the way in which governments have dealt with the COVID crisis. It has been very much a focus on only technological and only um, uh, scientific solutions. And of course we need science and we're extremely grateful for science. But science has been built into a true factory. And many scientists say that. Science is not a true factory. It's, it's, it's much better to describe science as organized doubt. Yeah, because the, the real scientist knows, okay, I have discovered this. I, I have come a step further. But I also know that there are still many open questions. So I have to continue my search and I have to continue to dig deeper. But if we use science in this absolutist way as a true factory, then actually we are, uh, we are in serious problem. We are in serious trouble. Because with that, we ignore the dignity of the human being to be allowed to question science, to be allowed to question the need of technology being the only answer to that. So these are three uh, three real challenges that I see at this moment. Thank you very much. These are all very thought-provoking challenges. We've addressed feelings and not allowing people what to say. So I'm turning to our audience now. How are we feeling? 
when whether we have anything to say. Because on the uh, gadget that I was given, talking about modern challenges, I'm not seeing any incoming questions, so I'm asking my colleagues if they see any questions incoming on the online platform. And if not, I'm asking whether we can do the Q&A differently. And if anyone has any questions sitting here in the audience, now is the time to ask. Yeah, um, I, I was the only chap who raised his hand to say that you've read Cicero and Laws. Uh, I was actually trying to find Cicero's teaching on of Terra Natura, but anyway, that's how I happened to, to, to read that particular text. You mentioned that the University of Leiden is dominated by legal positivism. The same is true in, 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 in Edinburgh School of Law. Can I ask you, was that part of the reason why you founded the Catholic Association of, of Lawmakers? Because perhaps Christians have been sleepwalking or they've been guilty of liberal drift, if you like, and they're only starting to become aware these are the challenges that we as lawmakers have to face, so we now have to organize ourselves to push back. Well, it's certainly one of the reasons, and because what I have seen over the years is that Christian politicians, also politicians or lawmakers that call themselves Christians, are very much part of the problem. And the reason for that is that most of them have not received the education to really understand this topic that we are, that we are speaking about. They have never learned, like I, although by the way, I love my alma mater very much, yes, but this is a point where I had to actually go to other universities to, to, to learn that. But uh, yes, because there is also amongst Christians, and this is a very worrisome fact, also amongst Christians there is a deep lack of appreciation and understanding of what the real foundations of law are and should be. And I see that in the fact that uh, and Pope Benedict again said that very well at his, his lecture in the, the German parliament. Um, also amongst Catholics and other Christians, there's a sort of fear to even use the word natural law. Eh? Because that is seen as something, oh yeah, that's just an, an outdated Catholic theory. Well, it's absolutely not, because that's why I quoted here Cicero. I didn't quote you any Catholic documents. I quoted Cicero. There was nothing Christian about Cicero. Huh? I mean, it couldn't be further <laughs> removed from anything uh, of the Judeo-Christian tradition in Cicero. But still, he said those things that, that I said. And what I see is indeed, your point is correct, that most Christians, also in public office, have no understanding of that and no knowledge of that. So um, there is a great need to answer your question for Christians in politics to start reading Cicero. <laughs> Thank you very much both for the question and the answer and we have another one. Hi there, can you hear me? Um, My question would be related to the fact that whenever we start law school, we are basically given the first lessons, the idea that law is based on a societal consensus. Mm -hmm. My question for you would be, if the societal consensus would change with regards to family, with genders and everything, can this be a motivation or something that is binding to lawmakers to actually redefine and rethink law in general? So what is exactly your question? No. So the thing is that we have a consensus in a society. Let's right. say we early define concepts of family, father, mother. And let's say if you want to redefine these concepts, can this be a justification so that we bind the lawmakers to abide to our societal will? So mm -hmm. if 80% of the society says that family is not what we originally thought it is, something different, should the laws abide to that? Well, we have to make a distinction between two things. And, and again, uh, sorry to be referring to it again, but it's, it's such an excellent, excellent document. Benedict XVI says that in the German parliament in 2011. He says, most of the laws that are passed by majority in a parliament, it's absolutely fine and perfect and no problem that merely the majority principle is enough. Huh? Traffic light laws or, or, I mean, you just name it. Most of it, that's absolutely fine. However, he says, where it concerns 
human dignity, the dignity of the human being. There, the majority principle is not enough. And there, he says, every legislator, basically, he says, has to go back into his or her conscience and actually ask the question, this is a fundamental issue. Can this be regulated simply by the majority opinion? And the example you give, in my opinion, a parliament certainly does not have the right to redefine the definition of the family or the redefinition, uh, let's, let's make it more specific. I do not see how a parliament has the right to redefine what marriage means. I do not see that right. Of course, most parliaments have taken that right and many courts have, but I certainly do not see that they have this right. Why? Because marriage as the union between one man and one woman is one of these foundational principles that have existed throughout humanity and that have not existed because some religious group or some church decided that they had to be as such, but because they derived from the reality of nature. Eh? Marriage is not an invention of, I don't know, the Catholic Church or, or whatever. Eh? Marriage came with the first human beings. Why? Because man and woman have been created as complementary, as fruitful, being able to, re to, to, um, to together um, bring about life. And nature has willed it as such that the best way to raise such a life is in a family where the mother and the father are present. No church or religious group has ever fought that up. That has just been the reality of what it means to be human. So there, for me, talking about your red lines, that is another red line where I, from my vantage point, say a parliament cannot be redefining that. Thank you. Provocative question and an even more provocative answer. Any, anything else? Anyone else? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, in theory, I'm really fond of this concept of natural law. Uh, however, I can see that throughout history, people have been debating about what these basic principles are. And I can, and I can see that uh, there is no fully certain answer to, these, to this question, so there's not a taxative list of basic principles. And as you mentioned, we live in a world where values are very subjective. And I can see two ways to enforce laws. One of them is public consensus, as mentioned before. And the other one is violence. So my question, uh, or, or uh, please, please uh, correct me if there is any third, third uh, way to uh, to legitimize lawmaking. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question would be, how can we avoid uh, invoking national legal principles? Because uh, how can I avoid the how can we avoid the bias to invoke natural legal principles uh, for the reason to to enforce laws that are good for us, so basically to be arbitrary. Thank you. Well, you speak about the concept of arbitrariness, and that's exactly the challenge that we have here. Because the moment we start redefining fundamental concepts of the reality of human nature, it becomes arbitrary. Let's go back again to the discussion on the pre-born human life. There is there is no sensible biologist that will tell you that life starts at any other time than at conception. So if that is a scientifically established fact, then any time afterwards you start defining as the beginning of life is then arbitrary by definition. Because there is also no scientific basis for that and no factual basis for that. So um, this, this shows the problem of arbitrariness. There are many elements to your question, so I'm just trying to uh, and stand up again if I don't uh, answer your question right. Then the other point as to you're saying it can either be by consensus or by violence. Um, yes, we know that from history. The problem is that consensus presupposes otherwise we cannot even come to that point, presupposes that there are certain fundamental principles that we all agree with. 
I'll give you an example, simple example I always give my students when we speak about this topic. Let's imagine ourselves that all of us are on a cruise ship somewhere far in the South Pacific, and the ship sinks, and we all get on life rafts, and we land on some sort of uninhabited island that doesn't belong to any state. And, you know, nobody comes to save us. And so we have to build up a new society. Yeah? So we start building our huts and, you know, we start looking for food. And one day, somebody steals food from another. We will all agree at that moment that that stealing is wrong. But why? Because there are no laws. The uninhabited island is not part of any international treaty or any national law. So why do we say it's wrong? Because it's, it's not written in any law. And the next day somebody gets killed after a fight over stealing. And again, we will all say, yeah, but this person has to be put behind locks, has to be taken away. But, but again, there is no law. This is the point I'm trying to make. Such a public consensus that you speak about always presupposes that there are fundamental principles that we all agree on and that are unchangeable. And this example shows you that everybody can understand that. We don't need the state to, to tell us that. We all have been given that as part of our human nature. So I would say public consensus, yes, but do not forget that it always presupposes acceptance of these fundamental principles. That's the second part to answering your question. Have I answered all the parts of your question, or is there an element that you still would like to hear? Um, yeah, mostly. Uh, my only uh, inquiry is still how uh, we can avoid that someone invokes these legal principles for the sake of using violence. And, Wh uh, which legal principles do you mean? Like basic legal principles. So, so, for, so for example, Someone says that this is, this is a fundamental principle that mm -hmm. comes from natural law. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that justification, I do violence and I pursue my own goals in the society. Okay, I understand what you mean. Yes, this is of course a risk. And, and, and by the way, we should not have any illusions about natural law. That's also why I, I even don't use the term a lot. I like much more to use the words of Benedict who says, pointing to nature and reason as the sources of law, because we can all understand that. You see, our understanding of, as human beings, of what nature entails, or what natural law entails, is a lifelong process where we are coming ever closer to understanding what that means. So we as human beings, and Jacques Maritain explains that very well in his book on this topic, is, is a process of coming ever closer to understanding what those fundamental principles are. So we can't really go around and say, oh, it's a principle of natural law that I can do that, therefore I do it. That's, you know, a, a, a state, a rule of law cannot function like that. So yes, we do need laws agreed by parliaments, obviously. Yeah? So we cannot go around saying, oh, that's a principle of natural law. That, that's not going to work. That's not, it's, it's, it's impossible. But, again, those arrangements of consensual understanding need to be rooted in, those, in a certain basic understanding of those fundamental principles, knowing that this is a process. I'll give you an example of that. There was never in human history any justification, real justification, for slavery. Yet it took humanity many hundreds of years to finally come to the point of actually doing away with slavery. That was not because it was not latently present in, our, in natural law that slavery is wrong. It was just that humanity hadn't yet come to the point of understanding that. So... This all means to say that this always, and this is something 
difficult also in politics, it always requires a certain amount of humility also from us. That, that we are underway. For example, I am convinced that probably, maybe not in 50 years, I hope in 50 years, but at the latest in 100 years, yeah, abortion will be outlawed as <coughs> slavery is outlawed. I am sure of that. Because I'm sure that humanity will gradually come to a more perfect understanding of what it means to be human and, and, and how life should be protected, exactly as that was the case with slavery. That took humanity a long time. So that is also the challenge. And that's why we have to be so careful in using the term natural law, because it is not something that you can... It's not like the Ten Commandments, you know, written in stone, and that's it, yeah? That's not how it works. Yeah? It's, it's through reason ever better understanding as humanity what it means to be human. And we have come a long way. Yeah? We have really come a long way, you know? I mean, if you think of the many injustices of the past and how in many ways that has improved, then you can see that as humanity, we have really made progress there in many other areas. Huh? I mean, if you still, if you read old books and you see the racism in, in those books, you're like, how is that possible? Huh? Well, in, in most countries, we have moved on and we have moved away from that because we have understood that that violates every aspect of human dignity. So that's the way we should look at it. Sorry, it's a long answer, but... But it was a long question, so it was a long fair question. is fair. Yeah. Everyone, anyone else? Then I think it may be time to simultaneously question the nature of our realities to become better lawmakers as well, and also accept the nature of our reality, which is that our time for today that has been allotted is over. So thank you very much for the thought-provoking lecture and also for the very good questions. I think we all deserve a round of applause. And thank you again for being with us today.